Hello, my friend. Hello. <laughs> I'm head to watch today. <laughs> well, friends, I want to thank you before we get going for all of your um, patience as we've had to change a little bit this morning and also to talk about the change that will happen at the lunch presentation. Um, before I introduce Donovan, I want to remind those of you who may have come in a little late that um, this wonderful person has agreed to do a presentation for us over at the lunch. For people who may have not registered for lunch, that's okay. We have plenty of food. Please come over to the student union and come to the center ballroom where we're going to have the presentation that Donovan is going to do for us. So it's going to be a wonderful uh, continuation, really, of the conversation that we're going to have today. So again, thank you, Donovan. Really had to move mountains to get over here this morning, and so we're thrilled to have him. If you've read the program, you've probably read the biography that we put together for Donovan. It could be five more pages easily. We had a conversation last night about a good friend of ours that uh, had an 80 page CV. This would be on that order. <laughs> so um, I've had the privilege of working with Donovan on several projects in Wyoming. I, uh, some of the just highlights of this man, I want to just start out and say, I walked down Main Street in Rapid City and had people come running up to us. They actually had a day, I found this out, they had a day, the Donovan Spray Day <laughs> in Rapid City. This man works tirelessly to preserve the culture of his people and to share it with us, with non-Indians and people of all cultures. He, um, don't know how this happened, he got a coat of arms from the Queen of England. He is just um, prolific in the amount of work that he is doing to help the people that um, he loves in the culture that he was raised in. He was uh, raised on the Cheyenne River Reservation. He is a mini Kanju Lakota. He is a descendant of a very um, important leader and a very important friend of Crazy Horse, with wh of whom he's also a descendant. He is the protector of his tribe's history. He works with tribes around the country, not just here in the plains. He goes every <laughs> summer to Indiana <laughs> and works at a center there. And I can tell you that part of the reason he was late today is because he was doing presentations on Pine Ridge Reservation yesterday and working with tribal leaders there. This is a guy who, I, he makes me tired just thinking about all that he gets done. And so we're really, really um, honored to have him here today. And it's gonna be another treat when we go over at lunch. And he's gonna give a presentation on the Little Bighorn. And we'll introduce that when we're over there. But what we decided to do this morning, um, you heard from our three local history specialists in a marvelous panel from Gordon, Rushville, and Hay Springs. And they talked about the work that they're doing to preserve muse history in museums and in records of settler families and longtime ranchers, as well as history that was uncovered from Pine Ridge sources. So we had a presentation on that. We had a presentation um, on how professors are using history and knowledge of this area to do, um, to teach students and to get more engagement. So what Donovan and I discussed is, why don't we talk about how he focuses on preserving and sharing Native American culture? So that's kind of a conversation that we're going to have. And we kind of picked several just high-end level topics, but I want to encourage you, this is an opportunity, we have 45 minutes to have a conversation with Donovan before he does a talk for us. And so I wanted to start uh, with just some very high-end basic questions and then drill a little bit further 
Um, we could pick any topic in the history of the Great Plains, and uh, in particular this region, and I guarantee you he knows somebody or has done something with it. But Donovan, I wanted to start and I'll hand you the mic. How did you get into this? Is this a family inheritance, or what is your reason to become this expert in American Indian history and scholarship? Well, thank you, Shannon, and I'm Pepti Washte. Good morning to everybody. Uh, my name is Donovan Sprague. My Lakota name is Chinkahu Wakantia, which translates to high backbone, evolved to the hump family. Uh, so, um, an answer to that question, I, I've always had an interest in, in history, and uh, you know, I did all, I guess, K through 12 on Cheyenne River Reservation, and I always talked to the elders, because I knew they held all the information, but, um, you know, I just uh, had a real interest in that, and I was fortunate enough to see some of our winter counts, which is the most important historical event of the year, drawn on a hike, uh, because we had, we had no uh, books, you know, and so I always noticed that, you know, I go to grade school, you know, and all I get was uh, Daniel Boone, you know. I knew there was more to the story, so as I, as I read books, you know, there's, I knew there was, well, the native side, but I never did find any of those books, really, uh, because I always had stories from our family of many places that they were uh, restricted to go to because when the surrenders came at the reservation, you could not just leave the reservation. You had to have a pass um, and, you know, kind of like a concentration camp, basically. So I heard all these stories about, you know, at the Battle of Little Bighorn and the Dull Knife Fight and, you know, all these different places that a lot of those people had never been but they had that very vivid in their memory, and you could just close your eyes, and they're great storytellers, and you could, like, you're almost like right there. So, um, and on the, on the other hand, it was very sad, because I thought, well, it's just too bad, because the generation before them, their parents actually seen these places. So uh, I'm really fortunate today that, um, that one of the places I live around Sheridan, Wyoming, I'm right in the middle of everything that they were talking about. And I get to go out and ride horses or walk on the very places, find the um, locations of where our people are buried, um, you know, and, and all kinds of stories that fit in there. And it, it's amazing how close it fits to the storytelling, you know, sometimes they say, well, oral history, you know, you can only do so much with it, but I, I think it's something that's really overlooked as well. So um, anyway, I, I always liked, liked history. I didn't read much uh, fiction. I was always pretty much a non-fiction person, but I guess with uh, Daniel Boone, that might have been arguable, you know, that's what I was reading. Uh, but, you know, one of the early books that I, I read that always led a, uh, left an impact on me was the um, Crazy Door, Strange Man of the Ovalala by Mary Sandoz, you know, and it's one of those books that really holds up, you know, very well over time. And, you know, I, we've had scholars who have evaluated that, you know, at the graduate level, they read these different books and, and give an overview of it. And, and it was kind of nice, too, to read about my whole family, you know, in her book. And um, so in, in her book, um, Hump, the one that she's talking about there, is my great, great, great grandfather. And there are two of them. Then the son, Hump, great, great grandfather, history has them totally mixed up. You know, they have both of them in one place. So they, they're calling one high backbone. And, the other one's hump, and you know, it's just totally, it's the same person. And I also wanted to clarify also that the first hump was the uncle of Crazy Horse. So in all the books, he's best friend, he's a mentor, instructor. Why is this older uh, guy with this younger boy, uh, David and Goliath, they're called, 
They're called the grizzly and the cub, and a lot of mystery. And, and all it is is that crazy horse lost his biologic mother at a very young age. And it's the uncle's job to step in. And, and the first hump was her brother. So really, the, the best friend confusion was the two best friends were Crazy Horse's father, who became known as Wag, Waglula. His name was Crazy Horse. He gave his name to his son. So it was the first hump and him were the best friends. So whoever recorded information along the way, and, um, they, they mistook that. And so still today, people, new books that come out, you know, friend of Crazy Horse. I don't know why they're together why they're friends, but hey, we know. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let's, let's just move right from there, and I don't mind sharing with this room. He has a, I mean, if you want to go back to the very beginning, you have a 700 plus page book written that is this in-depth, quite detailed history of his family and the history of, the, of many of the bands and tribes of the Lakota, but um, he's having a hard time getting it published. We have, several of us are working to get it at the University of Nebraska Press, the University of Oklahoma. My faculty friends here, I can tell you right now, they look at a book like that and they think, too many pages. But what is what is a guy like this cut out when he's telling that level of detail of history? So um, we're going to advocate, he knows, <laughs> Just keep trying. Can you cut 200 pages? But um, I want to tout this because this book will come out, and it's and pro it'll be on the order of Josephine Wagner and um, the recent books that have come out. And so, what if it's 700 pages? It's gotta it's gotta be here. So um, that kind of uh, goes to Donovan's one of his major works in public history is he publishes books. And um, he teaches at the university and college level. But I thought we would focus a little bit on preservation and public history, which, of which you just work tirelessly. You do teach up at Sheridan College, but they recognize that part of what you do is this public history, and this, they consider this outreach that he does. So we're really proud that they do that. One of the things that you do a lot of is you support tribes and their tribal historic preservation offices called FIPOs, very well known. So I thought maybe you could share with this group, what is a FIPO? What is the kind of work that you do with them and why are they important? Okay, thanks again, Shannon. Thanks so much for mentioning my book. I usually never get a plug for it. I leave places and they don't know the, the unpublished one. But it is, it is totally publishable. It's down in the 500 page. So it's totally, and it's in a University of Oklahoma format, 34 chapters. It's called Hump and Crazy Horse, a Lakota Cheyenne history from a family view. So, um, I, and I was prepared to go from here to drive to uh, Lincoln and hand this off in a three-page binder, I have it, or a flash drive, one of those modern things. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, with the historic preservation is really interesting, you know, and I, I just want to say something about distance, too, at the Plains. I really appreciated the comments of the panel right before us, you know, and, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, I grew up right, I'm out in the middle of the open Plains all my life, and uh, to this day, I don't, know my trees very well because I, we didn't have any trees. But I always knew sagebrush, different kinds of sagebrush. We had a lot of that, you know, and of course we'd see, you know, company coming, you know, from way off, some dust cloud or whatever, and so we'd have time to, you know, jump in the shower or else run out the back door before they got there. Uh, so with the historic preservation, those uh, TIPOs, T-H-P-O, those are um, uh, grants now that uh, any federally recognized tribe in America can apply or be part of that. And so it's done a great thing for um, awareness of history and getting notice because uh, federal entities or people that receive funding, um, federal, 
uh, are required by law then to uh, contact tribes of any like artifacts, you know, that they know of found or uh, any of that. And, and so that applies to remains as well. So under that part, it's under the uh, NAGPRA, the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act. So that's a, a tie in with that. And, and also, if you're uh, an individual uh, rancher, you have your land, uh, that's yours. That's the way that works, you know, that they, they don't fall under the requirements of that. So we have a real good working relationship with a lot of, you know, ranchers and other private owners, as well as big entities like the U.S. Forest Service, uh, BLM, and, and all that. And so they'll be contacting those TIPOs at each reservation. Uh, there's an officer there who is in charge of that. And then they have a whole staff, and, and they're just really as good as their grant writing, and they can build that office too. So we have uh, several people. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an archivist under the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, and although I'm not um, employed every day by them, I'm a tribal historian, I referred out, and I've been under contract with them for a while, but um, they, they call me for history, and also as an, as an archivist. And that arch archives is uh, one of the really big unknown things that probably uh, people don't even know about. There's two things I, I want to uh, make known today. Well, maybe three with my book. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's, uh, there's a room that I was in charge of and it was called the cold room. And what that cold room is, see, we're, we're also, the descendants of the people who were killed in the Wounded Knee Massacre. Most of those people uh, were from the north that journeyed down from uh, Standing Rock after City Bull was killed on December 15, 1890, and they traveled to the son of Hump, Hump my great-great-grandfather, is a big ghost dancer now after he surrendered with City Bull. They went to his camp, and then from there, they talked in, tried to uh, get our, his cousin, first cousin of Crazy Horse and Hump would be the person who became known as Bigfoot. And his name was not Bigfoot at all, it was spotted out. So uh, anyway, he goes on into Wounded Knee and the massacre happens. But my great, great grandfather did take in uh, several hundred uh, Hunk Papa and his own band of Minikoju and some Itazak Cho, another of our Lakota bands housed at Cheyenne River, into the agency at Fort Bennett because uh, he and my grandfather worked with General Miles. And uh, actually it was Miles who started slanging the high backbone and the buffalo hump. Well, we would just call him Chief Hump. You know, that's how that evolved through through miles. But uh, anyway, he brought those people in who then averted uh, the uh, Wounded Knee Massacre. But in this preservation area, it's a place that nobody would ever see or it would, nothing would ever be on display in this room. It's all temperature control and uh, it's all the artifacts or things from the Wounded Knee uh, Massacre. And even from around the world, we had, uh, we had one ghost stamp shirt that came uh, clear from the UK. One of our elders went over there, Marcella LeBeau, is a really prominent person who lived to almost 100 years old, was in the, the Battle of the Bulge and was at Normandy, you know, and, and she just passed a couple years ago. But she went over and, and was part of that repatriation thing where they gave this shirt back, but in this room is all full of items, you know, uh, little kids, you know, beaded uh, items with bullet holes shot clear through them, you know, riddled with bullet holes, dried blood actually still from 1890 on there. So there, that's a big decision too as to what to do with that stuff, but there, there is that place not to mention the whole history of our tribe. Uh, but what I found, most of that history 
Uh, there is some early stuff of like the state historians, like uh, Don Robinson, and uh, he was uh, came up with the idea from Mount Rushmore. Some of those people, and there are Lewis and Clark, you know, journals, and but the bulk of it is all what I would call more modern history after the Cheyenne River uh, Sioux Tribe is is established as a reservation, and then eventually moves to. Uh, to the Cheyenne Agency, which is flooded by the Wahi Dam, 1959, the move up to Eagle Butte. See, my, my history goes back, the earliest winter counts that I have in that, in that book, unpublished book, they start in the late 1600s. That's when my story starts in, uh, in the Great Lakes with some uh, incidents with the Ojibwe Nation and that. And the most recent events are about 1900. So as a kid, I always wondered, uh, well, why, why are all these winter counts ending? You know, my information's not there now. Uh, it was great, you know, 1600, 1700, 1800, and now it's, it's gone. Well, the reason it was gone is because our people surrendered on the reservation and those, those hides, were taken, confiscated by the agent, and they ended up in museums, Smithsonian, all over the world. So people wonder, well, how'd that get clear over to, you know, Berlin and London and Paris and stuff like that? So, see, that's where a lot of our uh, history and stuff is that we have to collect. So I've traveled uh, the world, you know, also, you know, in and that type of work. But then a little bit back to the story on the winter counts and the ending around 1900. Um, I, I found that the buffalo, of course, were also depleted. So, you know, that was another thing. The man was really very depressed. His role was hunter, provider of the people. And now his role was to go down and shoot a beef each first of the month, that was a beef issue at the agency. And they would shoot that, and then the, uh, the women would take the hides and prepare the meat, and he would go back, you know, and sit idle in the cabin now, and then next month, first month, okay, go down and shoot the beef, it's time for that. I mean, that, that's pretty dull, dull life history there. And so that's also when I found, just shortly after that, the star quilt evolved, and women kept busy with the arts and their hands and creating things. And I also found that's when terrible uh, alcohol problems developed with the man, because the horses were also confiscated, and, and that's his life, you know, going down each month. And, and they're still, you know, today people are talking more about historic trauma and, you know, Wounded Knee wasn't that, that long ago. And, uh, you know, when it's, when it's great, great grandfathers and mothers, you know, I mean, there's just a lot of, you know, history there. But the tipples are, I see it a really bright spot, you know, for our history. And uh, from that can lead to uh, museums, culture centers, and, and just a lot of um, interaction. So the other part that I do is, is contracting like with my tribe, but I contract with like the uh, American Indian Smithsonian in uh, Washington. So uh, I do have a, a uh, I brought the cover anyway of the book. I'm a contributing author to the book, Infinity of Nations, which you could Google. And that's a typical Smithsonian book, you know, the, coffee table, like nice colored pictures, full of artifacts. So my job in that was to uh, write about certain artifacts, in, especially in the plains, and there's Southwest stuff in there. Uh, but anyway, though, those items about, I think there were either 400 or 700, they, all of this was in the, in the basement of the Smithsonian and surfaced, and wow, it drew a lot of attention. And then it went into, uh, the George Hay Center in, in New York City, right downtown by Battery Park, might have been there. It's the old uh, American Indian Smithsonian. 
and so it's still affiliated, you know, with that. Uh, George Hay was H-E-Y-E, -E, was the great collector of all of the artifacts and, and donated that. But anyway, you might find that when you Google it into that museum, George Hay. So uh, the, these items from the book went on display in there and it was so popular, it became a permanent exhibit. So it's now a permanent exhibit there. So some of my tour people arrive from Europe and they land in New York and they wander around and wow, there's our, our guy right there. His captions are here in this museum before they ever make it out to the plains. And then I also work with the, uh, the new expansion of the West uh, Museum at St. Louis. Uh, it's right under the archway, a grand facility. And uh, so they, they pretty much have the bases covered for the, for the wagons and settler part going west, but what they had uh, recognized was they were missing some of the Native American side. So anyway, that's where I came in. So those are, and, and there's many more like that, but I just use the example of, uh, of a couple like that. And then um, for, for Europe, I also speak um, at place, I think, I'm the only person I really know of that didn't go to Paris or Germany and, and those places and not have to just dance to perform as a performer. <laughs> you know, I, I make bows and arrows in the tradition of my family. Um, I tan hides, buckskin, rawhide. I, I teach beadwork, quill work, and feather work, and I incorporate the heights and the flutes, because I make those. I never had to do any of that. I talk to them about our history and where things are going today, just like what we're doing here at Sandoz. And that's what they really want to hear. And, and, and everybody I know goes over there, they, they danced or performed, you know, they did hoop dance, they played the flute, you know. And, and that's all great, you know, all those colors and and, uh, but I'm really happy that, that I got to convey what I did and that, that side of it. And not that they're really in a stereotypical world because Europe is very up on Native American history and, and interest. So this helps to add to that. Most, most of their stories is kind of like my, my uh, uh, people that I said they you know, never did see the the spot where the history took place, they heard about it, and that's the way these people are over there. They, some of them will never be able to afford to come to America, but they, they love it and they have a good picture, image of, of what's over here. That's good. Yeah, no, that was awesome, wasn't it, you guys? <laughs> oh, Holly wants to ask you a question? Well, it's about um, artifacts. So I know a few years ago at OLC, um, Tala got called, there was, there was going to be an auction or a state sale someplace, and they had listed artifacts. And I was just curious if you deal with any of that. I mean, let me, let me repeat that for the, the camera. We did have a question. Um, recently at Oglala Lakota College, someone was contacted about an auction that was going to um, was potentially cool. sell some items. And are you familiar with this, Donovan? Yeah. All right, we're going to let him answer. Well, I'm familiar with some of the items there I could talk about. Um, so uh, some of those items included, and, and Tawa is a good friend of mine. She was, uh, uh, up until just a few months ago, was the tip of the Historic Preservation Officer for Pine Ridge. And I could tell one, one item that came to front, and this was just in the last year. In fact, I have a copy of the articles in my, my briefcase over there, too. But it, what that one was, was a letter that was found in Canada about the Battle of the Little Bighorn, which shed light on that. And, and it was a, a letter that was written, and it was from the Standing Bear family. So actually, she called me. She said she called me first. She said, I want you to know about this because you probably know something about it. Plus, she said, I don't... I don't want this to go to the non-Indian and they'll write a book on it right away. And I'm going to give it to a native author. So he has the, op well, I didn't have time to do none of that anyway. But I told her, I said, well, now this, 
uh, standing there, the reason it's written in a foreign language up there, Bob, is because the man Stephen Standing Bear, he did the illustrations in Black Elk Speaks. He's a mini Koju. That's my, my band. And so the Standing Bears are very famous from uh, Pine Ridge and Roseland. They went to the Carlisle Indian School. Uh, Luther Standing Bear, great success story, wrote my people the Sioux in uh, 1928. Um, Land of the Spotted Eagle, Luther Standing Bear, Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show. And then I have a group photo of all those standing there. There's Victoria Conroy, uh, she's in the picture as a sister. And there's Henry Standing Bear, he's the youngest one. And their suits they made them wear at Carlisle. And uh, uh, let's see, Standing Bear, um, Henry is the one who asked them to do the Crazy Horse Memorial carving. So he's, he became a Rapid City businessman later. But Stephen, okay, uh, what that letter was, was it, it reaffirms my book. I could even use that as a, yeah, here's a source. Uh, because it talked about a great Sundance that they witnessed right before the Battle of Little Bighorn. And, and real, you know, important notes about that and what was going on. So they knew this Sundance was going on and it, and it happened and it was written in this, I guess she's Austrian or German type language because Stephen married a, this lady from Europe. So in my Pine Ridge, like images of America, I have those photograph books, historic photos. Uh, there's a picture uh, of Stephen in there. And uh, so that's, there's a little caption in there, and it tells his wife's name, that she was from another country. I think they probably, um, maybe they met in Wild West Show, because a lot of those people that did that, they, they met in Europe like that. So anyway, that whole, I had a picture of them before. I sent her a picture. Okay, these are, this is the family right here. And so the descendant today, like in that article, which is also in my, caption is, uh, is the artist uh, Arthur Amiot. He's a well-known uh, yeah. artist. So, and Arthur's a good friend of mine. And I work with uh, Frida Mestin. She's part of that family as well for several years. And uh, so I had collected all that history from, from Frida and, and those people. And, and so with the article, they really tie in Arthur because he's the, also on the Board or was on the board of the Buffalo Bill Historical Society in Cody over there. And uh, yeah, great artist. But anyway, that story was all there. And then also, the uh, here we go back to that name that only existed in reality for one year, Bigfoot. There was an uh, actual uh, pistol of spotted elks that was also returned recently. And uh, so a lot of that stuff goes to Pine Ridge. And then over there, they have to realize, well, oh, okay, now, is this the place for it? You know, this is spotted out. This is, we're talking in the massacre. So is this the place for it? Don't, uh, uh, usually our people step in in the north when they, the southern Lakota make that decision and come down and say, no. And so anyway, it was, it was repatriated back to and in the picture was most of my own family. My, my uncle was in there and received it, and, and my brother received it, and there were six or eight people, elder, elders from the tribe, and other items of the, the person known as Bigfoot. So uh, yeah, a lot of stuff uh, where Tawa has done, and that's just typical of other uh, tipples like that. And I not only teach Lakota, history, I teach American Indian uh, history as well in the nation. So, um, you know, I worked with the Choctaw Nation for three years. I worked with the Potawatomi out of Oklahoma. Uh, and, and this summer I met with the Pokagan Potawatomi uh, Tipple, Tri Tribal Historic Preservation, up their uh, agency is up north of South Bend. So I worked up there at uh, Notre Dame, and then there's Culver and Purdue, right, in the middle of, of that. A lot of Tecumseh 
history over there. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. That's that's a good point question and uh, networking and, and link with the uh, with Pa. Well, she she's working with the uh, Red Cloud Heritage Center now. Yeah. Thank you. Can you see he's in an, an encyclopedia, folks? I mean, I never had him not know so many. Um, I, it sounds to me, and so maybe you can confirm this and we can talk about it, you work with so many museums. It feels like there's a movement afoot to repair and be better about integrating and incorporating the indigenous narrative into the story that a museum is trying to tell. Do you feel the same thing, or is it still just, do you feel it's a struggle, or how do you feel like we're doing it right now in the United States? Well, I feel that there's a great improvement with all of this. I think that assists everything. I, we were just talking about this, uh, I think it was yesterday, I did some interviews with uh, Clemson uh, University over at Pine Ridge. And, uh, but they were talking about that and how some of the students are picking up on this and they said, well now what can we do at the tribal level uh, to have like museum studies and archival studies and get the kids, you know, interested in that? Because I, I think it's kind of from teaching, I think it's kind of across the board, you know, there's the kids don't seem really as interested in that family history and genealogy until they get a little bit older. And then they start really digging and it's like, why didn't I start this earlier, you know? Uh, I was too busy uh, doing other, other important things on campus or maybe downtown like I was, you know? <laughs> but uh, because when I, when I went to school, I, it was kind of like the relocation thing of the old days, one-way one ticket out. We had the one-way ticket out, but it was called higher ed. And so I'm riding horses one day and the reservation, and then I decided, well, I'm going to go to school and be counted. I counted. It didn't take me long to get out of that field. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the place that I chose was I, I just looked at the books and I said, well, definitely go on here because everybody in this catalog, the kids are all laughing. They're having fun. And these are all serious over here. And I want to go somewhere where they're having fun. Hey, where, 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 did that, where did that turn out to be? It was the University of California, uh, Bay Area. So I was, I was culture shop right there in the San Francisco Bay Area, you know. And if that isn't getting to know something about your neighbor and other cultures quick, you know. And I, I could maybe expand just a little bit on that. We got out there, you know, well, something's come up, they're gonna cut costs, you know, gonna, you're not gonna be in the apartment you thought you were gonna be. Well, I didn't know where I was gonna be anywhere, so that turned out to be East Oakland. So uh, I was put into our, uh, East Oakland, our people, and then uh, about, eh, it was about four blocks east of there was uh, national headquarters of the Black Panther Party. And then the other direction about that far was uh, National Headquarters of the Hells Angels. And we're right in the middle of that. And the uh, neighborhood is about 94.3% uh, African American at that time. And it still is, you know. But uh, anyway, uh, that you learn a lot. And then what I found was all those people were interested in Native history. We were like celebrities. and. You couldn't help but say like, well, I'm gonna just close my eyes and door to that because, you know, I'm going to school and I can't, you know, you go down and you buy groceries or anything, and that's the people, that's the whole makeup of the community, you know? And uh, so, uh, it's not always free education. One way ticket out and back home they'd say, well, so-and-so, yeah, no, they're not here. They went on relocation. They're down in San Diego here. And they say, no, i seen them. And here they're, they're walking over by Thunder Butte, and they already beat the bus back. They're back <laughs> home. So another great, you know, program of, uh, of, of higher ed. But, you know, now we have counselors to look at that and, and help you decide where you might like to go and 
health and education has all been very important for me in, in the history, but I, I'm really proud be, because my family, you won't find their name anywhere on the 1868 treaty. They say, well, that provided education, health, housing, all the, this stuff. But because of not signing that, uh, Hump had 14 more years of freedom just roaming with his band. He eventually went to Canada with Sitting Bull and survived, uh, came back there, surrendered with 714 people were still intact in his band. And every man, woman, and child was written down in Lakota. It's in a book today called The Sitting Bull Surrender Census by my good friend Ephraim Dixon, who I, I've crossed paths with a lot down here. And uh, another shout out to another past friend of mine is uh, Tom Beaker. I spent a lot of time with, with him down here. So yeah, I see a, a bright future for that. And, and these, these kids in schools can't help but have questions when we come in to speak and offer to hand that information down. You know, um, I told a story, I just a couple weeks ago, I told a story I hadn't told for a long time, but I've been a, a speaker at the uh, South Dakota Penitentiary where the native student, native not students, but uh, you know, I'm I'm glad I was there as a speaker only. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I was just shocked that all these people they lost their history, you know, and nobody told them, you know, and that's why they're lost. You know, as I went in there, looked like kids. Well, this looks like a high school presentation, and you know, they just clung to me, you know. And, wanted this history, you know, because they never got that. See, that's important. That's what keeps me strong, the bravery, generosity, respect, wisdom, values, is knowing that inside, you know. And I know where I come from, and, and I could read Daniel Boone or whatever. I read those and, and appreciate those or Chuck, but I know inside my own history, and I know the land out there, the, how I'm connected to this land when I walk. And places I drive by, I'm aware of what happened over here. And on this beach over here and over here lies the resting place of uh, one of my family members. And uh, So it's really important to, to have that. And one of the things I want to mention too, this is, now I told you two secrets maybe, or that she did about my book, but the other, and then I think I only have one more secret after that. But I want to announce today, uh, this is the first place in the entire world, and any historian would appreciate this information if they knew my family, Hump and Crazy Horse. But I'm, uh, I'm making an announcement that I'm, I'm the only person that knows this, but I have my grandfather's winter count. Uh, and and when I, when I with this winter count, it was blank. It was just the drawings, and so I interpreted every single one. So it it's so roughly about the year 1780s to 17 to 1876. So almost a hundred years. And uh, hey, uh, since I mentioned that, I'll get out my other secret that, that nobody knows it. And it goes with that. Uh, Chardon is mentioned in, there's one entry for Chardon, who's Chat Chardon established a, a dirt lodge up on the mouth of the Cheyenne River. So there you have a, an entry right there. But that's on the, the winter count. But, you can see the benefit of that with like with a book. So I think with uh, Shannon even has a rough copy of that, but um, in, in the main book, those are my sources. Like I said, back to the, 1700s, to the 1600s. It's because they always want to know well, where, what book is that in them? Is it in Daniel Bowen or not? <laughs> and I say, well, I, so that the whole academic world had to understand that what a winter count was and how that worked 
you know, and it's the only thing I knew that when we always do everything clockwise, and it goes counterclockwise, see, because we're, we're backing up in time on the high. You get to the outside part, and that's the 1900 uh, time period there. So, uh, I mean, why wouldn't somebody be interested? I mean, that could be a book in itself, but why wouldn't uh, a publisher be interested in, in that type of history? I, I review books of the New York Times, the latest book on the Battle of the Little Big Horn, a non-Indian has wrote this. A lot of them never been out here to Montana, and I give them a good review. They've done their research, but why would they not want to talk to a native where Hump fought right on the Custer Hill? He, he did a lot of the heavy fighting right on Calhoun Hill, which we can talk more about later, but um, that, that just uh, puzzles me. You know, I have, I have 10 books anyway, and I, I could have 20 now if I kept writing with that published, because they're, they're all historic photographs. You know, it's a totally different world as any author knows. And so, um, anyway, um, that's a long answer that's again to your question. <laughs> well, that's a great, segue into what we're going to talk about at, at, at the lunch presentation. Um, I think you all can get a sense of the sources that Donovan uses to tell his story. And I think that you can get a sense of the frustration we have. Um, I've got a lot of my colleagues here who publish books, and some of you know who I'm going to be talking to and about. Um, we really need to get this kind of work out there to help us Maybe it's not in the format that they're used to seeing, but it's, there's a lot there, and it's a great book. And so um, I welcome you all to walk over to the Student Center, and we'll have lunch. We'll give Donovan a chance to uh, grab a bite, and we'll probably start around 12.30, quarter to, yeah. to one, and we'll have about 45 minutes, but lots of opportunity for you all to ask Donovan questions as well. So thank you, Donovan, and thank you all for thank you. Thank you.